Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. I'm Ken Hamilton. And we have, for the very first time, a guest with us. Our guest is Angela Lucier um, of speaking speaker sisterhood fame, but more importantly, perhaps of claim the stage fame. Angela's whole gig is about helping people figure out how to claim their truth, speak their truth, say it on stage or wherever else they need to. And today we're going to talk about relationship stuff, but I think it's important to say that you talk about talking about hard things all the time and talking about red flags, green flags, yellow flags in relationships is definitely one of those hard topics. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is a crossover event. It is. Usually on the other podcast, but here we are. Right. Yeah. It's, it's our first crossover event. I'm, I'm psyched for it. So are you joining our podcast or am I joining your podcast? We, you know, we, we don't even know who could say, yeah, <laughs> who could say it's really, ha- I'm happy to have you here because we, when we talk about, um, relationship stuff and it's just Ken and I, um, we can, we can start to feel a little insular and especially in COVID, it feels very insular because even though we're polyamorous, it's COVID and I'm not going out and we've been very, we've been very, very tight in our circle. Um, so I haven't had to deal with a lot of red flags and green flags and yellow flags. So you have though, <laughs> you, you have like, to who deal do with know? <laughs> Who do we know who has had to deal with some stuff? So when we're talking about flags today, we're talking about what is it that you can look for in a relationship, either at the beginning or maybe even before there's a relationship started, um, that can tip you off as to uh, potential future behavior. Um, But red flags, green flags, this stuff can show up later in relationships as well. It is pretty easy to have a relationship um, red flag, especially go undercover and not really show itself to you. Um, so yeah, we're just going to jump right in. And I want to say that we're, the reason we're talking about red flags and green flags is it's great to look for the stuff that we don't want to see red flags. And Angela, I know you have some awesome stories for us. I know Ken has at least really one spectacular one about red flags that would have alerted you to danger. (laughs) <laughs> before things got really out of hand. But before we go there, I just want to say that there are some green flags. And a green flag in a relationship is when we see something that is exactly the behavior signal that we're looking for. Something that's going to set us on a track to having a closer relationship, having a more secure relationship, or even just having a, a functional, casual relationship that works for all the people involved. Um, so before we get into red flags, a couple of green flags so that people don't get too downhearted because the red flags can go to the dark places. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So (laughs) my favorite green flag, um, is actually just someone being interested in growth, their growth and my growth and just general people's growth, just someone who's really interested in growth more than they're interested in their comfort. That is a huge green flag for me. That tells me that this person is willing to get into some, some discomfort in order to learn about me, to, to come to compromise when that's necessary, things like that. Um, so that's my favorite green flag. Do you have a favorite green flag? So the green flag that I think of is, um, well, it's a little cliche, but a sense of humor, which it's a flag. And you have to look closely at it and it might be green. It could also be red. It depends on the sense of humor itself. 
Uh, but the presence of a sense of humor to me suggests that this is a person who looks at multiple sides of a thing um, and in, in, to me is a little bit in line with another green flag that I like, which is curiosity, mm. asking questions, not just like on a date, which is great when people ask you questions on a date, um, but just in general, asking questions about the world. What about you, Angelo? Yeah. Like well, one of the things that I just started to realize was when people have skills that are different from mine that mm -hmm. I can learn from or that can complement what I bring to the relationship. And I, I noticed that recently when I was talking with someone uh, via text and I was having technical problems trying to get something set up on my computer and he started text. He was troubleshooting with me and he was su adding suggestions and sending me links. And I thought, oh, this is such a nice little bonus. And this is a nice green flag because he's not only showing me that he has skills that he could bring to the relationship, but he's also recognizing that this is a place where he could like help out and um, just try to be there for me in a different way. And you know, really you know what I love it. about that is you also got to see what kind of a teacher he is. Like, is he a guide? Was he a suggester? Um, how, what was his patience level while you were working on something? Cause that tells me a ton about a person and I, I really appreciate it. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I was, I wasn't consciously looking for mansplaining, but I was aware of that. That could be the next step of when, you know, a guy is trying to teach you something, <laughs> but it never went in that direction. So it felt like a nice green flag. Yeah. I like it. I like it. That's one of the things that was a green flag for me about Ken. There were plenty of red flags. I probably should have run in the other direction, but <laughs> one of the biggest green flags for me was that you were such a patient teacher and we were learning a lot of complicated things together. We were learning how to set up a business together. We were also learning complicated things like Olympic weightlifts. Like we, we were learning them and I, I would get super frustrated on the, on the gym floor. And he was so patient and, um, and he has the patience to teach a toddler how to tie their shoes. And I believe that that is like a game patience. And I knew that I needed somebody around with patience because I had a um, I think one metric buttload of growth to do in order to be somebody tolerable <laughs> to have a relationship with really, I, I was just, I was not in a good space then. So your patience was greatly appreciated. <sighs> he did have plenty of red flags though. Oh, there are so many. <laughs> when you were asking Angela the other day about red flags, I was like, well, I didn't, I typed it and then I erased it was, uh, well, Jolie could spend a day on mine. <laughs> <laughs> and they've shifted they've shifted like you still have some red flags that everybody does like everybody has some behaviors that they exhibit that are like I don't know they could they could play poorly with other people's behaviors maybe those would be more yellow flags like these might be behaviors he he can be a stage three clinger for sure that's yeah. real yeah some of my flags have been bright red and illuminated when I'm a good boundary setter. So it's yeah. not actually a big, yeah. it's not a huge deal for us, <laughs> but I think that's interesting that there are still red flags in your relationship. What 12 or 13 years later, like a bajillion years. Yeah. <laughs> what, <laughs> what are some of the current red flags? I think that when, when I have I, I'm going to speak to this because this comes up most from my direction, but I, I think it's just because he's way more tolerant than I am. Um, we get into a place where he will start copying things that I do and he'll be like melding himself into my life. He'll, so he'll be, it's codependency, right? It's just I'm really a stage five clinger, I'm very <laughs> advanced. It's so when I notice that I have to remember to like bring all of my, my full self to bear. Um, I can't get, I can't get lazy about it because otherwise we'll get all enmeshed. We would just melt together and that's not the relationship either of us have wanted. So while I don't think it's something that's going to break us up really at any point, it is something that like it, while it, it makes him haul his butt to therapy. It may, you know, and it has a lot to do with how much I just lean into the red flag and just let it be. Like, yeah. So there's versus your... looking at it and saying, "Ooh, maybe, maybe not so much with that for me," and I'll see if I can fix it. Yeah. Hmm. And for me, I I'm gonna volunteer because I don't know that you would say this, but when I am really stressed, I can get really aggressive 
if I really trust a person. So it's yeah, a, it's, it's a perverse, it's like I won't get aggressive with people unless I really trust them. But once I do, my aggression may come out. And so, yeah, he definitely has to stay aware of the fact that that's, that's a presence. Learning about your, um, your hostility, which would come out early on. Yeah. Uh, and, and how, what to do with it, what it meant and what was behind it. Yeah. It's challenging and, and tough and your withdrawal. Yeah. Right. Cause it looks very different from yours. Yep. When, um, yeah. So uh, something happened and, and, and you would have a way of, of separating from me consciously, like verbally. I'll use hostility visibly. to separate <clears throat> the yeah. two of us, and which that, obviously is not the mature grown up self I would like to bring to the party. And doesn't work too well for me as, uh, as an avoidant personality. Um, it's a struggle to then reconnect, to be the one reconnecting. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's interesting to watch how our particular sets of flags interact. Mm -hmm. So you're dating right now. You're out in the world, whatever that means. <laughs> and that means to me, it means that you are getting an up close and personal view of what's going on in the world, in the dating world. And it must look a little bit different from previous times because yeah. You have to do so much Zoom dating, right? Mm -hmm. Are you? Do you think it's easier or harder to spot these telltale signs? Um, both. It's it's kind of easier in some ways in that you're really focusing in on what the person is saying, and there's not a lot of uh, chemistry to cloud it because you've got a screen between you, so there's no like pheromones being exchanged. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. He could like drop off a sweatshirt at your house to sniff while you're. <laughs> we, really need I, I a whole, we need a whole Zoom dating class. We really do. Ooh, we do. We definitely. So in that way, I can focus in on the red flags, but you also miss a lot of red flags because you're not in person. So you're, you're not able to see how they interact with a server at a restaurant or if they're on time when they have to actually leave their house and, and travel somewhere. And what, how do they show up in a restaurant? Are they dressed in clean clothes you know, yeah. when you're on Zoom? It's like, you can wear anything like sweatpants you've been wearing for four weeks. Like it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. You can just put your, you can put the virtual background up and it could be Never a clean. total, total hoarder <laughs> situation back there. And you wouldn't even know. Right. And yeah. I seem to have an a, attraction to guys who have a mattress on the floor for their bed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do so all of you, all of you get a platform bed at the very least, just do it. A hundred bucks. It's so simple. Just up off the floor. Cause you know what happens when your mattress is on the floor? It is gritty. You think it's not, you're wrong. It's gritty. Mm -hmm. We don't want to get into that bed. Also always shake off the sheets. This is Ken's pro move every night before green bed, green flag. He shakes off our bottom sheet. If he hasn't just changed the sheets, he shakes it all off, then remakes the bed. Doesn't matter. Even if the bed was made in the morning, oh, that's, yeah. that's a green flag. That's a bed you want to get into. Yes. Even with a guy. <laughs> See, I know I'm working against, uh, you know, the um, a handicap. <laughs> yeah, I've dated too many men. I go into their apartment and they've got a, a mattress on the floor. And it's like, oh, okay. And it's not it's a futon mattress, not even a real mattress in my 30s. Yeah. It's like, why? <laughs> I think you can draw, you can draw a line in the sand. You're 40 now. You can be like, nope, there's the line. Yeah. So that, that I've been too forgiving about, cause it's never gone well. Those guys don't want to grow up. They're not interested in really moving beyond the teenage bedroom setup. And I, it's like, you see a match on the floor, just run out the door, just, just run. Just don't like, even... and they weren't going to serve anything good. Anyways, they were going to make you like hot pockets. It's not, <laughs> totally. it's not good. <laughs> or they're going to make spaghetti and somehow think they did you a favor. I don't Yeah. Get but it's so milk good in those little half pint containers. Yeah, we're not here for it. This is not. Right. This is not okay. <laughs> but if you break up the Doritos on top of the spaghetti, it's so good. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! I can't believe we have to talk about no. this. <laughs> this is the reality of dating, though. You just yeah. don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, 
but there are lots of red flags. Some of them are visible on Zoom, some aren't. One of them that comes up for me that is a big deal for me is when somebody intentionally fosters jealousy. Like they intentionally, they want to foster jealousy. So they're like, like intentionally making sure that you are thinking about who else they've been with and trying to, to goad you into feeling comparative and je- I hate that. That mm-hmm. drives me crazy. I know where that goes. Um, and it's specifically about this like scarcity mindset and the idea that we should only all be in love with one person. And then there's like this pitting of me against other women. I don't know. I don't like that. Now I've never had a woman try that on me. So I don't know, maybe it would drive me just as bonkers from a woman. Um, and I've definitely had never had a non-binary person. I've never met a non-binary person who wasn't super, super lovely. So I've never gotten a red flag from one of them. So I don't have anything much to add to that. But dudes who foment jealousy, I got nothing for it. No yeah. Way. Yeah. That's gross. Yeah. It's gross. Yeah. Speaking of flags, it's like they're playing capture the flag. Yeah. Very competitive. Very competitive. Like view. dating as a competitive sport. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So what else shows up for you? Well, <laughs> I, w- I was dating this guy for a few months and every time we would go somewhere, we'd go to the gas station if we were in his car and he would put five or $10 worth of gas in his car. He never filled it up. And at the time I thought maybe he just doesn't have a lot of money. I don't know. We were just getting to know each other. And then I realized he had no problem spending a hundred bucks on dinner, but he would never fill up his tank. And it started to get really aggravating because every time we would go somewhere, we'd have to go to the gas station first because he never had enough gas in his car. And I realized he's just super disorganized and he's not a planner. And it was such a dumb thing. And I thought, I kept saying to him, why don't you just fill up your tank? And he'd be like, why? There's a gas station everywhere. You can just get gas anywhere you go. And it made me crazy. And that was such a red flag because it was such a a look into how his brain works. And I thought down the line, we're never going to be able to plan a vacation together. We're never (laughs) going to be able to organize a home together because this guy can't get his act together to even just fill up his gas tank so he doesn't spend his time at the gas station every day. Yes. It's a dumb thing, but those are the little flags that give you such insight. I lived with somebody once who would not like stock their pantry. They just wouldn't. So every day and they not like, hey, we live in downtown Paris and we just go to the market every day to get our food. No, yeah. we live in Westfield. This is not. <laughs> no, we just go to the big Y and, <laughs> and get our food. So not having pantry staples in your house when it's not a money issue. I just. No, that does not work for me. It tells me that you're going to live moment to moment, which sounds good until you're trying to do it with children. Yeah. Like Mm -hmm. that's not about staying in the moment at that point. That's about not being able to feed anybody breakfast because you're, you have nothing. There's no milk. And being less resilient to, for one thing, the things that happen with kids around. That's why people always wind up getting milk and bread the night of the snowstorm. Right. I never, I've never needed to go shopping the night of a snowstorm ever. It's never happened. You just, because I plan all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's not, it's just not for me. So some of these are even like, they're, they're person specific. So you and I have a pretty similar status for how we like things to be planned, organized. We like to know how things are going to go, but Ken, you haven't always needed those things in your life. So that might not set you off the same way. Well, it's, it's hard to say because um, living with you and having children with you has opened my eyes to the value of planning. Yes, I have not been a planner um, in my life, but now when I run across somebody who's not planning, I see all the worst parts of me. It's like, no, no, it's like <laughs> highlighted now. Like, oh God, no. And for one thing, um, yeah, I don't need, uh, we don't need two of us, for one thing. <laughs> but more it's, I, I now have an association with uh, failure to plan and that has to do with resilience and like what's gonna happen and, um, and hoping that someone will be better than me at it. <laughs> so I, I don't think we could possibly have a red flags discussion without talking about gaslighting. Hmm. I think like, I, I mean, it is talked about so frequently now 
But the basics of gaslighting, you know, when somebody attempts to manipulate or coerce you into not believing yourself, like separating you from your own sense of reality, it's not even just about truth, but reality. Um, and the phrase, the word gaslighting comes from an old play where the, like the, the guy in the play was like intentionally driving his wife batty by, um, like dimming the lights and then pretending nothing was wrong. And so gaslighting, like, tr- like turning down the gaslights. Right. So you didn't. I have some experience with gaslighting. <laughs> you have some experience. We, I think everybody's experienced it. I don't think I don't think anybody gets by without experiencing it, but I'm interested in how do we notice that somebody's doing it early on enough so that we, we can avoid the, the pain of it. Cause once you're really in a relationship with somebody, it's usually hard to disentangle from that because the gaslighting becomes part of the manipulative nature of it makes it harder to untangle yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think it starts with having a really, really strong sense of self. And if you come into the relationship and you don't have that, you're so susceptible to gaslighting because they create such confusion that if you're not used to trusting yourself, you can really easily just trust the other person. So I think that's where, that's probably the key. Yeah, so building a sense of self and practicing that. I know you've been practicing listening to your guidance, listening to your inner wisdom. Um, how long has it taken you to, to feel like that's really developed in you? I know you've been working on it for a while. Yeah. 40 years. Um, okay. So <laughs> that, 40 years and, and a couple days, or did you take those first, that first week off? <laughs> I think I took the first week after birth off. So we'll yeah. go with 40 years. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's been a lifelong commitment. <laughs> Happy birthday to your inner wise woman. <laughs> I I think just as of two days ago, I was like, I think I finally trust myself. (laughs) So that's huge. huge. Yeah, it is. It's a big deal. It's like, it's kind of funny that it's it's aligned with my 40th birthday too. I just feel like, oh, this is kind of fun because it's kind of like a marker of, of pre kind of like childhood to real adulthood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I've done a lot of work because I've been gaslit. Is that the yeah past tense gaslit, gaslighted? Um, I've been gaslit, and I've I, one of the other red flags I was going to mention was being love bombed, mm. and that's when you get into a relationship with someone and they're giving way too much too quickly, and they're being too helpful. They're being everything you want them to be really soon. And when you're not used to being treated that way, it can be really easy to be taken, taken, but um, I don't know, not taken over, but just swept be off your feet. Yeah. Swept off your feet. Exactly. Because this person now all of a sudden wants to mow your lawn and buy, go grocery shopping for you and get your oil changed in your car and help you with whatever you need to make your life easier. And being an independent person and working alone and doing all of those things. And then having a, a, a guy show up who wants to be all of those things that you wish you had in your life can feel really good. But the red flag is when all of that stuff comes really quickly and without building any sort of relationship or trust first, there's gotta be question for why, why is, why is that happening? You know? And, Cause we uh, see it turn up in a certain kind of person. I mean, Clinically, I mean, therapists see it turn up in a certain kind of person, a certain kind of narcissistic person. It's a, it's a tactic. It's a move. Yeah. And most narcissistic people aren't aware of the fact that they're, <laughs> that they're experiencing narcissism that they, so they, it's not like they're, they're planning it, but it is a premeditated move. It's designed to encourage a certain dependency and a certain, amount of um leaning in so that you won't trust yourself and so that you can be um manipulated it may, it's making me think of the judo move like so if you're if you're in a judo competition as i understand it you're not trying to use force to move somebody around the floor you're simply getting them off balance and letting momentum and gravity do the work yep. and that's what that reminds me of like here this is this is love you can't possibly 
you can't po possibly think bad of somebody for jumping in and helping you and being kind and doing all of these lovely things. And yet, yeah, it, there, there is an opening there. It can create an opening and as, balancing. as somebody who has grown up in the classical masculine culture, um, I have been aware, uh, I think it's really come to light in the past year for me of how many of the things that I've sort of picked up just in my life through stories and, and cultural references and things, how manipulative so many of the things that I think are relational, how manipulative they actually are. Because I think about that thing about like mowing a lawn. Okay, there is a point at which I would offer to mow your lawn. And if I do it too soon, why? What, what is it that I'm doing it for? And it doesn't have to be this thought out plan at all. It's just this intuitive sense that if I do this thing for you, it's going to invoke certain feelings. It'll cause you to act in certain ways. And just that, I've just caused things to shift for you is a, like, is a thing that I notice and certain kinds of people will chase that. They may or may not care what it is that you're moving toward. They more care that you're moving yeah. and they're making you move. So there's, yeah, manipulation is, um, and it can take many forms. And the, mm -hmm. and manipulation is one tactic, um, but it can go along with a bunch of other things like you, um, like being inconsistent. So, you know, it might be love bombing, but then all of a sudden, like they're not there for a week and, you know, they're like, they're totally, or they're totally emotionally unavailable or, um, or they disappear or they don't return your texts or, um, or all of a sudden they're really hostile, um, that inconsistency. And if you grew up in an unstable home environment, especially, I think we're especially prone. Um, I grew up in a very inconsistent household and, um, it, it leaves me open to that. I, when I, when I feel the inconsistency, I feel both upset, bothered and, and I, and aware, but if it goes, if it cuts too deep, I feel myself slip into my child self where I'm, I'm all kinds of triggered and whew, that is, it's so challenging. I can, I can't, I have to really think about who am I relating to and who am I relating from? Am I being myself? Or am I in my child self just because it's inconsistent? Mm -hmm. So hard. So hard. Mm -hmm. Are there things, Angela, that you respond to, that, like things that are red flags for you that you resp respond really strongly to that you're... Like that you're not... good at picking up, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, probably the... Um, reliability. I would say that's probably the biggest one that I tend to notice is like, are they doing what they say they were going to do? Are they following through? Even if it's, I'll shoot you a text later and they don't, it's like that, that's a red flag for me. Cause I don't, in the early stages, every interaction is an opportunity to build trust. And if they drop the ball and they don't come back and say, oh, sorry, I didn't text you last night. There was an emergency that came up or something. There's no recognition of that. I'm super, super aware of it because I think I spent so much of my childhood feeling like I was being told one thing and another thing was happening. And I was constantly feeling like I was in the dark and I didn't have trust. And now I really want that badly in my relationship. So when it's not there, I'm so aware of it really quickly. And it really turns me off. I think that's one of the things that has worked so well for you and I developing our friendship is um, I think I'm, that's one of the features of me is that I tend to do what I say I'm going to do. And so it's easy for me to, to show up for you like that. Um, and you also are like that. And so it, it, I felt like that was one of those ways we could mutually support each other in developing trust. And, you know, we talk about red flags and green flags in dating so much, but they're in friendships too. There are, I have, I have been attracted to and, com and like felt compelled, but to be friends with people before that it turns out, you know, I, I get three or four weeks in and I realize, oh, cause this is an old pattern. This is a kind of friendship that I'm used to having. Um, I'm pulled in by people who are, um, yeah, like clueless. It's not quite needy, but they seem clueless. Like they just don't understand. And I'm like, oh, I can help that except 
it's not always clueless. A lot of times it, it has been that they, that's their move in, in relationship. That's how they like to be. And it, down the road, a year in, that doesn't work. That's it's so uncomfortable for me. Um, it, so it's something I've had to become better at seeing sooner so that I can set a boundary faster so that I don't just wind up collecting up a bunch of people <laughs> who are like, I want to pretend like I'm clueless so that I don't have to, you know, hold the responsibility for things. I don't have to lead things. I don't have to guide things. I can just sit back and I can ride in the back seat all the time. I don't want people who can just ride in the back seat all the time. And that seems to be the majority of adult friendships. It's like, you can take them or leave them. I mean, yeah. you're the only friendship I have where we are very intentional and like we communicate all the time and we are open and responsible and everyone else. I know it's kind of like, I might not hear from them for a month or two months or three months, even after I've texted them a question that felt to me, like it was sort of important. <laughs> it's like, that That's is just... right. And it's what a fascinating thing because we, at the same time, we want to be flexible with people and recognize that sometimes we can't meet each other's needs. You and I have certainly had those moments where like, you know, I'll say, Hey, can you listen for a minute? And you're like, I'm not in a good headspace," or you'll ask me for time. And I'm like, I have to teach right now. Or I, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just too overwhelmed though. So those moments happen. But if, if they become the norm or if the ghosting thing in particular becomes the norm and you've experienced this, Ken, I know in trying to reach out to friends recently, especially mm -hmm. um, where they'll just disappear. Like you'll be having a conversation by text or having a phone conversation that gets interrupted and then nothing for a period of weeks. Yeah. And when did we let, let's all just collectively ponder. When did we decide that was the norm? And let's just pick one person in your life and make that not the norm anymore. I don't, and not That's the person you're idea. married to pick one yeah. person besides the person you're married to at least to make that not the norm. Cause I also know I'm guilty of doing that too. Oh, I know people. you are too. And if Ken has ever done that, you can email me Jolie at JolieHamilton.com <laughs> because I would like to know about it because he's made a commitment to not do that. <laughs> yeah, if Ken goes to, you, I am totally your backup call. <laughs> I love this being yeah. called out on the back. I know which two people are going to be emailed. <laughs> Excellent. I like those two people. That's great. That's no problem. That's are great. you guys wearing matching necklaces? We are. It's so goofy, isn't it? Yeah. I love great. it. I got I love these. matching necklaces. They're like, they're like half of a scene, like a, a moonlit scene. That's so nice. You have half a moon. And yeah. It's, so, it's like goosh. It's very no, goosh. I'm really into it. it. I'm it's loving this. Very smoosh. <laughs> Yeah. And most of the time I am not the mushiest person in the world, but when I'm mushy, it's like over the top, wildly mushy. So when I bought you your Elizabeth Lesser necklace, I had, I also had seen this one and I was like, well, got to get it for him. Just, yeah. just have to, because I didn't Good. see it at his birthday. So yeah, it's really yeah. cute. <laughs> so I want to list a few more red flags because there are some big ones that should like, they should get said. Um, lack of empathy, just, a, and so you mentioned when you're going to a restaurant, you usually get a few opportunities to see how someone treats the wait staff, um, or, or treats the valet or whatever, like you get a chance. Um, or even if you can just go on a walk with somebody, usually you have some opportunity to see, but it's hard to see over zoom. Lack of empathy is an, is essentially epidemic proportions at this point, <laughs> Um, and so, but it's, for me, it's a non-negotiable. If someone hasn't already been working on their ability to, um, yeah, put themselves in someone else's shoes and, and it's not going to look the same for everybody. I recognize neurodiversity means that empathy, empathizing and the acts of, you know, being human next to somebody are going to look a little bit different person to person, but that is a no-go for me when somebody just can't. Absolutely. It's yeah. a problem. Yeah. Big one. Overly critical too. That's on my list. Yes. And I, that's one I'm very guilty of. I was raised in a highly critical household. I'm an ENTJ. I am, <laughs> I am a double Leo. I am, I was born in the year of the dragon. I am a hyper critical person. And criticism was a lot of the parenting you got. Criticism was so essentially 99% yeah. of the parenting I got. 
So I have to watch for it myself. And when I see it in somebody that I'm hanging out with, I'm very, very aware of it. And it doesn't necessarily bother me. Like I can get pretty far with somebody who's very, very critical. Cause I'm like, sure, we'll go. Let's have this relationship. And so now we're in this very aggressive relationship and that does not work. Luckily you aren't critical at all. You barely even manage the critical thinking part. <laughs> it's, it's not true. So was that nice? Did I, did I just embody it? I think I, this was a real life lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody should trust me to be anything but real. It, it's, it's, you're so not critical. You are so kind and you are too. You took, you're both so nice. <laughs> we're the same person you are my god you're just like the same person you both like blocks like l-o-x not like yeah i was I, I didn't know where you were going with yeah that. that's <laughs> no like 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 locks on a bagel that yeah. makes us the same person yeah. yeah that's it that's all it takes that's all it takes it's just that it's just being nice and liking locks that's all it's just those two things okay. you're also exactly the same height so there's that right Right. But you know, I mean, you have headphones. He does not have headphones on. Right. So I can tell you apart. It's fine. <laughs> got the same microphone though. <laughs> we do have the same microphone. No, but you guys are both so nice. So what do you do when you when you like when met with someone like me who is critical, who can be overly critical? Like, what do you do to protect yourself? Like, if you notice that, is it a red flag and you run in the other direction? Or is it, I mean, you obviously did not escape me, but, <laughs> but do you, or do you, what do you do? Do you, do you set a boundary? I have had to practice boundary setting and I still have more practice to do. I'm not great at it. I mean, clearly I just did it right now. <laughs> and all I did was laugh. <laughs> um yeah uh so the boundary setting is key and one of the things that i do is i i stand in it on purpose and part of it is self-serving part of it is okay what is there for me to actually get out of this and how much of it is true and how much of what is true is something that i actually want to change mm. And then sometimes um, it just hurts. And I would prefer to set a boundary, which I'm very clumsy at because I don't do it very often. So then it. You've been practicing more and more, I like have. in really, really good ways. Your boundary well, setting good. has come a long way. So I, I sit in it um, or I will sometimes just let it go by and decide that it, it's not about me. It's about you. He definitely does that. Um, it's a masterful trick too. Cause I'm like, oh, that didn't land at all. That means it, oh no, <laughs> I, I have to recognize it. It's terrible. It's very it's, effective with it's you. It's so effective. It's painful and wonderful. Oh, that's just all me being hypercritical and ah, mm -hmm. now I have to really let that be true. How about I you? Have, I don't experience you being critical with me. You do give me feedback, but I wouldn't say it's critical. It's like constructive and, but it's very rare. You don't give me very much feedback that isn't positive. I think but I've been very careful. You have been. <laughs> you are very careful. <laughs> you don't have to be, but you are. <laughs> I, when I'm around critical people, I tend to not be bothered by it unless they're pushing my buttons and like my ex-boyfriend knew all of my buttons so he could push them and they would just tear me to pieces because mm -hmm. he knew how to do it. But very not a lot of people know how to do it. So that doesn't really bother me, but I don't like being around it. I just think it's very negative and closed-minded and boring. I'd prefer being around curious people than judgmental, critical people. So I would just put an end to that relationship because I just, I think it's, it's just not interesting, that mindset. I like that. It's just not interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just not interesting. It it's one of the reasons it works on you to to let it slide by. You're like, oh no, I'm being dull. I, I cannot tolerate <laughs> I <can't> that. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot handle it. No way. So I I um I was thinking about how how hard it is to to say whether we're experiencing a red flag or whether we're experiencing someone who is in growth and. 
one of the things that I think is cl- is really, really clear for me, and I think it's the last red flag I'll talk about, is um, a really a really core value difference. That so it's different from somebody having like a manipulative technique or being overly critical because this isn't something that they shouldn't have. They're, everyone's entitled to, you know, their value system. It's theirs to have. And yet if my value system is deeply different um, in some profound ways, like, I mean, honestly, even just somebody who wants um, children versus doesn't want children or somebody who um, I, I struggle with somebody who, for instance, doesn't want to, doesn't want to read books like that doesn't work for me. It sounds simple, but I would get bored really fast. And so just noticing that I get to have my, my, my desires, my, my wants, my values, like they get to be important and that I don't have to treat somebody else's value system as it can be equally important, but it can be separate from me. (laughs) And, and then I get to pick and choose whether I want that to be the, whether I, whether I want that to be what's in my life all the time. Yeah. Cause the red flag doesn't have to be, you're a bad person. It's just like, well, that's not what I want. Right. So you have a great story about that. <laughs> yeah. It's a short story. Um, red flags, things that I should have known. You were mentioning critical thinking before. Well, so um, I am somebody that uh, sex is very important for me. And it's, I mean, yes, I like sex, but I find sex meaningful. It's it's a valuable part of my life that I would not want to not be a part of my life. And uh, knowing that about myself, if someone came to me and I we were in a relationship and they suggested, well, what if we were celibate? No judgment, but no thank you. But at the time... But I wait, didn't wait, see it. But this isn't a hypothetical. No, this is not a hypothetical. This happened to you. Um, and you were it wasn't directly after sex, which would have been that funny. Been, okay, that would be really <laughs> funny. What about celibacy for you? So, so <laughs> that would be really funny. And if somebody ever has sex with you and then pulls that off, I will be really, That's I think I would really feel like good. this whole podcast <clears throat> yep. was worthwhile just for that. That would be very funny for me. So there you go. It's like an Easter egg hunt. But it's a thing you can do. This really happened for you. You were in yes, a relationship for a like relationship more for, than a year. Yeah, you know, um, uh, like years? three years, I think. And, and then celibacy was put on the table. There was like, hey, so so what do you think about being celibate? And um, <laughs> sorry, so, it's so funny right? though, right? Uh, two, like... two things. <laughs> I, I did not pursue it from a, like a. Well, if they're thinking about that, I should be thinking about the fact that they're thinking about that. You might want to consider the See quality where, of sex you've been having. What's happening here? Because um, it might not have been working for everybody in the room. <laughs> and I don't even remember what the discussion was like after that, other than... Um, I imagine crickets. A lot. Of, I imagine a lot of crickets. Well, I think I said, well, why? Like what? And then the discussion went on and I don't think there was a lot of real communication happening at that point because of other red flags that I wasn't looking at. But yeah, um, so that is something that I So then I you now, just married her anyways. No, and I married her anyways. And that's <clears throat> fine, except it played out. I will grant her this, she was being honest. Yes. Um, it, and you didn't It may listen. have so, been one of the most authentic moments. So the red flag was waved in front of you and you were like, here's your off ramp and (laughs) you're not gonna take it okay i had a similar experience so i was i i was with somebody who didn't like to talk he didn't like to talk he didn't like to talk in high school he didn't like to talk after high school he didn't like to talk when we were dating he didn't like to talk when we were engaged and i just kept pursuing throughout our entire 17 year relationship i pursued and just kept like nagging and picking at him to talk, but he he didn't like to talk when he was 15 and he still doesn't like to talk. <laughs> the red flag was shown. It's on me that I decided I'll just change that. Where did I think that was gonna go? Um, but we're given so many ideas that that somehow all of these things are changeable, but that was actually a really core feature, something I needed in my relationship. You like to talk. I really appreciate that. I do that. like to talk. You like to talk, Angela. I, I, I have lots of people in my life who like to talk and I'm so much happier for it. Yeah. 
I have a core value mismatch red flag. I was dating a guy who owned a motorcycle and we met in August. So his motorcycle was in the backyard. And then as our relationship went on and the seasons went on, winter came and we had a snowstorm and his motorcycle was still in the backyard and covered in snow. And I said to him, do you want to put something over that or put it in the garage? And he's like, oh, I'll get to it. The whole, we went through the whole winter and he never brought his motorcycle in. And it was just sitting out there with ice and snow all over it. And in the spring, he tried to start it and it wouldn't start. And he was like, oh, whatever. And I thought that's weird that he doesn't seem to care at all about his motorcycle and keeping it, you know, in, in, a, in <laughs> like functional. <laughs> <laughs> and then we ended up moving in together and I realized he has no respect for his possessions because he comes from a background of money. And I came from a blue collar background where we barely had money. So I valued all my possessions and I would keep them clean and indoors and, you know, dry and things like that. And he would just treat everything like it was all disposable and he could just buy more anytime because he could, and it didn't matter. And when we like lived together and it came time to bring all the stuff in that was out in the yard from gardening and stuff. And I would ask him to help me. He'd be like, it's fine. We'll just get new stuff next year. And that was a huge problem for me. Cause I felt like we worked hard to buy all these things. And now you just want to like throw them away and just buy new ones. And that, that never worked. We, we had so many arguments about our stuff, especially our shared stuff. Cause he had no respect for it and didn't care. Cause it was all just stuff that could be replaced. And to me, it was like, these are things that I wanted to keep and cared about. And he didn't. Yeah. That sounds like a, a hard one to notice at first because you, I mean, because we all do live differently and sometimes people really do have to sort of mature into taking care of their stuff, but, but ouch. Yeah. That would, that would totally have eaten away at me, except I was also, I was terrible about taking care of my stuff when I was younger because I was raised blue collar, but by hoarders who didn't take care of their stuff. So it took me decades to learn how, like decades. So I would have come at that from a, a completely different angle. I would have been like accepting of that, except not for the right reason. So we still would have fought there. <laughs> I'm just noticing how like, there are so many different ways to mismatch with someone that I'm just appreciating the miracle that there are any people in the world at all. <laughs> <laughs> who I observe with green flags and like in positive. Well, it's Very. pretty clear that I should not date. <laughs> I'm listening to all this. I'm going, oh yeah, that's me. Oh, that's me. Oh. Yeah, I do that. Yep, that's me too. Huh. <laughs> okay, but wait, wait, wait. I have a whole list of green flags. Okay. I have a whole list of green flags and you have a bunch of these. Wait. So um, I already said interested in growth, but um, has a practice or a process. A oh, person crap. who has a process. Uh -oh. <laughs> you're, you're developing one. Oh, yeah. um, a person who has a process, like for when they have feelings, for when stuff happens, for when grief comes up, for when anger comes up. A person who's either, you know, participating in therapy or going to self-help groups or participating in 12-step groups or something, a, a spiritual devotion. Have all of the above. A process <laughs> yeah. or 10 in your pocket. <laughs> just do that. That's a thing. Yeah. And, uh, boundaries, people who can like, not just set their boundaries, but communicate them, which is, they're not the same skill. Some people can set boundaries, but they don't communicate them. So then they get really mad at you when you break them, but they didn't communicate their boundary. So now you're locked in this constant need to like read their mind. So, but being able to set your boundaries and communicate them in, in lots of ways in verbal ways and Your written gesture ways included and... all of me <laughs> <laughs> oh that's not true you're actually really good at setting your boundaries now it's just that you're subtle your communication is subtle luckily COVID has provided this bubble over us where i have gotten to very much attuned to your boundaries yeah. um because we're in the bubble but you know what else is somebody who values friendship like however that's going to play out i I didn't realize how much I needed that. Somebody who valued friendship, valued their own friendships, values the friendships of their partner of like, that's a huge green flag for me. Somebody who's willing to show up for other people. Mm -hmm. I, that that's just like, yeah, I don't want them to just show up for me. I want to see that they want to be like a person in the world showing up for other people. 
Love that. Yeah, like you came over and brought um, jalapeno poppers. Yeah, showing see? up. Yeah, yeah, yeah showing up with jalapeno poppers is like double <laughs> bonus that's, points. That's points. <laughs> yeah, big yeah. green flag. That's real. <laughs> and then um, somebody who like participates in some self care. It's like, like, especially I would say for, um, for that, for those people who are a little on the quieter side, I, I don't always know what their self care is. So I'll ask flat out, like, what, what do you do for yourself? Like, how do you rejuvenate? How do you, how do you refuel? Because otherwise as an extrovert, as a person who gives a lot, I know that I can be the person who everybody uses to fill their cup and that gets exhausting. So I will ask the questions like, so what do you do so that so that I know I'm not going to wind up just being like a watering can constantly. <laughs> right. It's a good question. Yeah. And um, yeah, the last one I have is vulnerability. Somebody who's willing to be vulnerable and well, I mean, just share the, their, their clay feet, their foibles, their, and their feelings, their actual feelings. I, I was once on a date with somebody who must have been in deep grief they had just lost a member of their family like two days before and they just pretended like it wasn't happening. They just like pretended. Now they might've been in shock. It's possible, but nothing that happened over the coming weeks told me that that's what was happening. They just appeared to be, uh, you know, they had a wall. They had just, you know, put that whole idea of grieving on the shelf and that's, that didn't work for me, but I've been with lots of people who, exhibit vulnerability in so many different ways and that is yeah it's right up there with empathy for me so courageous yeah that's a good list I like that I like leaving on a hopeful note because it's not fun to think about all (laughs) the red flags all the time I am so appreciative of you showing up and and talking about all these all these indicators all these warning lights and flags with us thank you so much for Thanks for having me. This was really fun. This, this has been awesome. fun. Okay, everybody. We'll be back next time talking about something really, really fun, but I'm not going to tell you yet because I'm going to surprise Ken with it Ooh. when we actually record it. So yeah, it'll be totally fun. Thanks for coming, Angela. It was really, really delightful to have you here. Anytime. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to jolie at joliehamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the entrepreneur's action plan for passionate, sustainable love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.